Hi, this is Rex Mendoza from Ramper Financials. It is indeed an awesome time to learn. So Ramper Financials friends or RFFs, you're in for quite a treat. For those of you who are new to our channel, welcome. We hope that you will consider subscribing and make us a part of your financial and life journey. This is such an exclusive video. Originally, it was an event solely for the platinum members of the Truly Rich Club of Brother Bo Sanchez. But the content was so rich, the learning was such that it has to be shared. And I really thank Brother Bo for allowing this, for us to be able to share it with all of you. In so doing, you will know and have a glimpse of what happens at PRC, the kind of education, the kind of mentoring and learning. So you might want to consider being a member. We're going to be putting a link here if you do want to check it out. Again, it's an interview with Mr. Bernard Vincent Bobby D, the president and CEO of Ayala Land, the country's most respected, biggest property developer. Bobby is a great corporate executive, a great servant leader, and a staunch supporter of sustainable development. He will share a bit of Ali's history, and most importantly, Ali's five-point strategy for the pandemic and how they are able to create a robust platform of growth for the company moving forward. If you're a business leader or an entrepreneur, you're going to be learning much from Bobby as he shares strategy, entrepreneurship, and leadership within such a vast and challenging organization that's into a lot of other businesses, quite a conglomerate. For those of you who are Ali shareholders and who are considering investing in Ali stock, this might be a way of learning not only of how resilient Ayala Land can be, not only how it's going to be surviving this pandemic, but how it's going to be growing and thriving afterwards. But you also might be an Ali customer, a customer for many of its brands. It will also be heartwarming to note how you're going to be taken care of, how the organization values you. So no matter what role we have, as far as Ayala Land is concerned, this will be a rare, gem of an opportunity. Please do watch till the very end because the Q&A section is as rich as the presentation itself. And I guess at that particular point, it's not about Ayala Land. It's more about the leader behind it. This said, we'd like to spice this up. We are going to be doing something that we've never done before. As you like this video and give us a thumbs up on it, We'd like you to also jot down in the comments area insights, lessons, feedback about the way you feel about what you're hearing. And just type them down. Type them down. Because we're going to be raffling off prices to people who are going to be writing down comments. Yes, five MaxiCare e-ready cards. So if you have your own HMO coverage, you can actually elect for your spouse or your children or whoever eligible person you'd want to be able to give this to. So again, RFFs and friends, thank you so much for being with us today. Enjoy this video and we hope to see you soon in the future as we load more content, more material that will help us navigate the challenging journey of our financial lives. God bless always.
All right. I'm um, I'm I'm going to turn the I'm going to give the table now to Rex, who will be introducing our very special guest today. Rex. Okay, friends. Uh, our guest is the president and CEO of Ayala Land, the largest and most respected property developer in the Philippines. He joined the company in 1997 and held various leadership positions that enabled him to propel the growth of its major business units. Today, he continues to steer the company towards its vision of enhancing land and enriching lives for more people. A champion of sustainable development, he empowers the organization to embrace the principles of sustainability by focusing on site resiliency, pedestrian and transport mm. connectivity, eco-efficiency and local economic development in creating integrated mixed-use communities. Beyond his role in Ayala Land, he serves as the president of Bonifacio Art Foundation and Hero Foundation, a nonprofit organization assisting the orphans of Filipino soldiers. He has also been a director of Junior Golf Foundation of the Philippines since 2010 and has served as its vice chairman since 2017. He was named Asia's, not Philippines, uh, Asia's best CEO in investor relations by Corporate Governance Asia in 2019. Prior to his career in Ayala Land, he lived overseas for 16 years, during which he completed his education and took senior regional roles for multinational companies in Hong Kong and China. He received his undergraduate degree in business administration from the University of Notre Dame in 1985 and earned his MBA and MA International Relations from the University of Chicago in 1989 and 1997, respectively. I had the distinct honor of working with Bobby when I joined Ayala Land in 2005. We shared challenges, difficulties, but much more often, successes and milestones. I think I've shared many of these stories with you. Bobby is a servant leader and a humble steward. One of his aspirations is to ensure that Ali will have greater brand or brands and a much stronger organization when he passes the torch to a successor in the future. I have mentioned this many times in our mastermind meetings. Bobby is one of those few people I will choose to work for. Not just with, but work for. He has taught me a lot and with him, I became a better corporate executive and entrepreneur. Over and above his professional accomplishments, he is a grounded family man, a loving husband to his wife, Lani, and an active father to his two children, Sabrina and Jed, who are young achievers in their own right. Friends, it is my privilege to introduce an awesome friend, Mr. Bernard Vincent, Bobby D. Bobby, good morning. Thank you so much for good morning. being here. Uh, thank you, uh, Rex, for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, okay, uh, can everybody see my, uh, my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. So, so again, a uh, good morning uh, to all of you. It, it's truly uh, a pleasure uh, for me uh, to join uh, this quarterly meeting. Uh, thank you, Brother Bo. Uh, thank you, Rex, uh, for, for this invitation. Uh, and to allow me to give, uh, I guess, perspectives no, on, this, uh, on this pandemic, as well as uh, Ayala Land's plans uh, during this most uh, you know, challenging uh, period. Uh, but before I go through uh, our plans, uh, allow me first to share a little bit of a background uh, of Ayala Land. Okay, Ayala Land, uh, we started as a division of Ayala Corporation uh, back in the 1940s. Uh, as many of you know, uh, our first development was actually here uh, in Makati, uh, the Makati Central Business District, as well as its surrounding uh, subdivisions and villages. Uh, since then, uh, we've had many, many uh, projects. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, we started development uh, of Ayala Alabang. Uh, in 1990, we introduced uh, Cebu Business Park. Uh, we also acquired uh, interest in FBDC in 2003, which is now called Bonifacio Global City. And we introduced New Valley in 2007. These are just some of the uh, uh, estates or projects uh, that we have. Uh, going back in 1988, uh, we were spun off uh, from Ayala Corporation and we became a full-fledged uh, subsidiary, 
that led to our public listing uh, in 1991. So close to 30 years now, uh, we've been a publicly listed uh, company. Now, our, our track record, our history really is rooted in creating communities. Uh, and these are typically uh, large scale, uh, integrated, uh, mixed use uh, communities, or what we call uh, estates. So we use this uh, as a platform. Uh, we create an estate like Makati, use it as a platform, and then put in our various uh, product lines, be it residential, uh, office, uh, uh, hotel, uh, malls, and also invite you know other businesses. Uh, to join us uh, and therefore create a you know, holistic uh, community uh, that, you know, we hope uh, really truly enriches the lives uh, of our customers. No? So we strive for something uh, that is complete in terms of a community, a business, residential, uh, various institutions like hospitals, uh, schools, so that all these uh, elements are highly synergistic to create a better quality of life uh, for our customers. Uh, equally important, uh, we feel that uh, these uh, estates, as we call them, also become economic engines, okay? And therefore contribute to development, uh, to the economic development uh, in their respective uh, localities, uh, as well as contribute significantly to employment a generation. As many of you know, uh, Ayala Land uh, for the longest time uh, has been known primarily for our high-end uh, developments. You know, back in the mid 2000s, and this is the time when uh, you know Rex Mendoza uh, joined us. You know, we reviewed our our mission. Okay, and our mission is to enhance land, enrich lives. And at the time, we felt that if we were to become a significant con uh, contributor to the national development agenda, that we needed to be able to reach out uh, to more Filipinos. So since that time, we had actually uh, changed uh, our mission to now say enhancing land, enriching lives for more Filipinos. Okay, and, and since then, what we've done is we've really broadened, you know, our product offerings. Uh, you know, we've really geographically diversified uh, to be able to reach out uh, to more people. So today, uh, we're actually in 56 uh, growth centers. Uh, we have 29 of these uh, estates, as, as we call them, uh, all the way north to Tarlac in Crescendo and all the way south uh, to to Davao. Uh, in addition to that, we've also introduced now uh, you know, new products, new brands to be able to cater to uh, different price points. So for example, in, in residential, uh, we used to only have Ayala Land uh, Premier, which is our luxury brand. Uh, today, we have five brands. So we're able to service uh, you know, buyers from price points as low as 450000 uh, for a house and lot, a house and lot, and all the way to upwards 100 million uh, for luxury. When you look at our malls, they were known primarily here in Ayala Center, uh, primarily uh, for the affluent class, uh, Glorieta as well as Binda. Uh, but today, we you can see we have Market Market, uh, we have uh, Trinoma, and recently uh, we're also managing Tutuban. And this basically caters to much broader uh, section of our population. Uh, for offices, uh, same story. Uh, we were known for AAA buildings like our corporate headquarters in Tower One. Uh, but now we have BPO campuses like uh, UP Techno Hub, uh, where, where we're able to you know, cater to a broader base of uh, businesses that are looking for more, more affordable uh, office spaces. Uh, for hotels, a uh, similar story. Uh, we used to just uh, get international brands to locate in our estates like Hotel Intercontinental, the Mandarin Oriental, uh, Fairmont and Raffles, uh, but in 2012, uh, we formed our own uh, Filipino brand, uh, Seda, uh, which you now find in, in many uh, areas, uh, not only in Metro Manila, uh, but in some of the key cities here in the Philippines, like Iloilo, Bacolod, uh, Cagayan de Oro, uh, as well as uh, Davao. Uh, 
Uh, same thing for the resorts. When we first took over uh, El Nido, it was primarily island resorts at a fairly high uh, price point. Uh, but today, uh, we develop a Leo estate uh, to be able to broaden our offering to basically more affordable uh, tourism uh, accommodations. No? Uh, so we have Casa Calao uh, in Leo as well as Sedo Hotel now uh, in Leo. So again, the thrust is to really you know, uh, broaden, uh, to be able to reach out uh, to more Filipinos. And because we've done that, uh, we've been you know, uh, fortunate uh, as a company. We've been blessed uh, that we were able to grow uh, significantly uh, during this period. Uh, if you look at the last 10 years, uh, truly, uh, they've been, uh, you know, breakout uh, years. And I just have to, you know, give credit to the team that we had at the time, particularly our, our CEO, uh, Mr. Tony Aquino, who really started this journey of significantly broadening uh, uh, our portfolio as well as a, a significant geographic, uh, you know, expansion. Uh, Rex Mendoza was part of this uh, was part of this journey, and Rex was primarily the architect uh, of you know our branding strategy and the market segments that we will basically uh, get into. Uh, so if you look at the last ten years, because we've done uh, we we basically reached out to to more people, uh, the performance uh, basically speaks uh, for itself. No, our our net income grew significantly, outpacing uh, GDP growth, and therefore our share price. Uh, also outpace the uh, PSE index uh, compounded annual uh, growth rate. But as many of you know, uh, we're now in uh, a pandemic. Um, nobody uh, had anticipated this. You know, obviously our company uh, has not been has not been spared. Uh, we've been significantly affected uh, in terms of uh, the current business that we're doing, and as well as the performance of our of our share price. No? Uh, but we feel confident that uh, this pandemic. Uh, just like in in 1918, the Spanish flu pandemic, uh, it will it will it will basically get resolved uh, in the next year uh, or so. So, COVID-19, the lockdowns, uh, as I said, it has really caused a major disruption. Now, I don't know of anybody, I don't know of anybody who saw this, even in January or February uh, this year. Uh, nobody saw a lockdown coming in March here uh, in the Philippines. And we were looking at what was going on in China, uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, you know, there were lockdowns that were going on, but we just never really anticipated. Even, uh, you know, even our own uh, uh, risk committee, you know, we have a risk committee here uh, at Ayala Land. You know, pandemic was just never part of, you know, the various risks uh, that we track. Uh, you know, I meet with many, you know, investors, uh, stakeholders, uh, and I get frequently asked over the years, you know, what are the things that, you know, you think about, you know, in terms of risks? I, I just never saw this, okay? It was just never, you know, in my, uh, in my radar uh, that this is even uh, remotely uh, possible. No? Uh, but we all know that it has happened and it has caused uh, a major economic uh, contraction. Uh, here in the Philippines, our GDP contracted by 16.5% in the second quarter. The worst that our country, we've never seen anything like it. I mean, I was here, uh, even if you look at the 1980s, uh, during the debt crisis uh, that we had in 1983-1984. Uh, the economy never contracted uh, by this much. In the Asian financial crisis, a similar story. We got hit hard, but the economy never contracted uh, in this kind of magnitude. No? But obviously, we, we remain hopeful. Uh, now that the economy is starting to, to reopen, uh, we're hopeful that you know things will start to get uh, better uh, and better. But obviously, when the, uh, the, the pandemic hit, I, I think it's important to keep a perspective, okay? I mean, obviously a lot of people were anxious uh, during this period, myself included, but it's always important that we keep the right frame of mind. And that frame of mind for me is all crises come to an end. They do. So, I, you know, the chart that I'm showing are basically the, 
you know, global, regional, uh, local uh, crises, uh, sorry, local crises uh, that we've seen uh, over in, in the 20th century. Uh, the Spanish flu, uh, the Great Depression, uh, World War II, uh, our own local uh, debt crisis that was triggered by the Aquino assassination, and the Asian financial crisis. Now, if you look at this, uh, if you look at the charts at the bottom of the at the bottom part of the page, what you see here are basically uh, two things. Okay, one is when the crisis hit, you get a major contraction. Okay, you can see it. Uh, these are very, very deep uh, economic uh, contraction. But what you also see is once the storm blows over, then you have a very sharp rebound. Okay, so you have a very sharp rebound. So the most important thing when this thing uh, struck us, at least for, for me and for us at Ayala Land, is to make sure that during this period that we keep our heads above water. Okay, because we know that eventually a strong recovery uh, will happen. Okay, and I do believe that. I believe that here uh, in the Philippines, a strong recovery will happen. The elements or the factors that made a successful pre-pandemic will continue to be there uh, post-pandemic. Uh, let me name a few. Our large, young uh, population base will continue to uh, to be there. Uh, many countries, as, as you know, are struggling with an aging population and therefore they're very concerned about their economic uh, growth. But here in the Philippines, our average age is uh, 23, 24. Uh, we are now in a period of what they call a demographic uh, sweet spot wherein more people are working uh, compared to people who are not working. And this will basically propel our economy forward. Uh, you know, pre-pandemic we saw it. I expect that post-pandemic, it will continue to be there. Our macroeconomic fundamentals continue to be in good shape. You know, in fact, you know, pre-pandemic, this is the best that I've seen, uh, you know, in the Philippines. Uh, low interest rates, uh, low inflation, our government's fiscal position continue to be very healthy. Uh, Pre-pandemic, our debt to GDP, and, and you know, for us who remember the 1980s, we know that uh, too much debt could lead you to, to trouble. We are in very good shape. Uh, debt to GDP, uh, pre-pandemic, was at 39%. Uh, today, even with the pandemic, with the contraction, what they're anticipating is for 2020 and 2021, we will be in the 0.5 or 50% to 60% uh, debt to GDP uh, ratio, no? which is which is very good because if you compare us uh, to other countries uh, like even advanced countries like Japan, uh, U.S., uh, these are much lower numbers, which gives our government a fiscal space or spending power to be able to pump prime uh, the economy and lead us to to recovery. Foreign exchange, same situation. I think we now breached a hundred billion. Uh, U.S. dollars. So again, very important that we'll be able to service our debts, our foreign debts, and secondly, that we'll have capacity to pay for imports that we will need uh, to restart uh, our growth. The economic pillars that we had uh, pre-pandemic, I'm anticipating uh, will be there uh, post-pandemic, uh, namely uh, the BPO sector uh, as one example. Uh, you know, we have a lot of BPO uh, locators in our various offices and, and nobody has contracted. Uh, in fact, uh, we've been able to close uh, significant spaces uh, during this period. I mean, there was one about maybe six weeks ago, uh, a new uh, multinational company that booked uh, about 22,000 square meters in a building that we're about to complete in 2022. That's the uh, one Ayala or the old intercontinental site. So, you know, BPO, I believe, will continue to be a very strong pillar. And, and the numbers are compelling. You know, a one full-time equivalent, cost of a one-time full-time uh, full equivalent of an employee in the U.S. 
is about $70,000. Uh, here in the Philippines, it's $18,000. So it's huge. It's what? What is that? Close to four times. So the numbers are going to be compelling for BPOs. And we know we have the talent here uh, in the Philippines. So my sense is BPOs uh, will continue to be a main driver of our economy. Second, uh, overseas Filipino workers. And I know, you know our overseas Filipino workers have been hit. Okay, but once the global economy recovers uh, because of our service orientation, the talents that we have here, I expect that those remittance numbers uh, will go back to uh, previous levels and resume uh, their usual uh, growth uh, trajectory. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, you know many of our kababaya, uh, kababayans now have, have lost uh, employment, but once the health crisis and once global GDP uh, goes back to to you know to what they're saying now would be a sharp rebound, they expect that uh, demand for the talent, the labor that we have, uh, will continue to be there. Uh, tourism uh, was a fast-growing uh, area or segment for us. Obviously, that's been affected significantly uh, by the pandemic. But we have so many things to offer in the Philippines. Uh, hospitable people, uh, beautiful islands. So again, my expectation is once the pandemic, the health crisis is over, then people will start coming back and uh, visiting our uh, tourism sites. So I, I do believe that the sharp rebound will happen. Uh, things that uh, were positive in our development pre-pandemic uh, will continue to be there. So the important question for Ayalan, and this is really what I want to talk about today, is what do we do uh, during this period, right? Uh, you know, how do we keep our heads above water? So at Ayala Land, we came up with what we call a five-point uh, action plan you know, for only for the COVID-19 crisis. And we basically came up with this plan uh, just for this year. And we quickly rolled this out uh, to the organization uh, in the first couple of weeks. In fact, in the first uh, couple of days, I met with my mancom and quickly agreed on what our plan should be. And, and let me just highlight the importance of that. You know, people were feeling anxious. People were feeling worried. We needed to make sure that we reassure our people, our employees, that we have a plan moving forward. We want to make sure that everybody's aligned, okay, that we get full alignment, that this is what's, what we're going to work on uh, for 2020. Now, obviously, things can change, right? I mean, you know, we don't know what will happen, whether it's going to be another lockdown or no, no lockdown. But the important thing is first to come up with a plan and then tweak it or change it along the way, depending on uh, the situation that, that we find ourselves but critical to have a compass uh, for the organization uh, to follow so we came up with this five point plan uh, namely uh, protecting our people uh, serving our customers uh, helping the community thinking ahead uh, for recovery because as, as i've said uh, there will be we anticipate a bounce back and underpinning all of these is to ensure our financial sustainability as a company. Because if we're not financially sustainable, we cannot do the other four things. We can protect our people, we can serve our customers, we can help the community, we can even begin to think towards recovery. So the most important element that you know we face is to ensure that our heads are above water. So let me talk first about financial sustainability. Okay, companies, particularly real estate companies, get into trouble primarily because of two things. First, it's about liquidity. Okay, and let me define that. Liquidity is not having enough funds to be able to service your obligations. Okay? The second thing that gets real estate companies, in fact, even most companies get into trouble, is all about solvency. And let me define that. Solvency is not having enough assets to cover your liabilities. So we took stock at Ayala Land. So first we check for 
solvent C. Okay, and on the upper right hand side uh, of the chart, we'll show you the different estimates of what we call NAV or net asset value, which is what is the value of our assets less our liabilities. And what you can see from the chart is most, uh, well, all the estimates, okay, that uh, indicate that solvency is not going to be a problem, right? Our value ranges anywhere from 700 billion to close to 1.2 uh, trillion pesos after servicing all our obligations. Okay, so no problem. I mean, solvency is not a problem. So we now needed to focus on liquidity. Okay, that we have enough cash to be able to service all our obligations. Now, why is that important? Number one, you know, during a crisis, what you don't want to do, particularly in real estate, is you start liquidating prime assets because you won't get the right value. And we know that once this pandemic is over, uh, those values will go back right up, right? So important that we are not forced okay, to sell you know, any of our prime assets. That's why we really focused on liquidity. So we checked, okay, how much cash do we have? How much unutilized credit lines do we have? So we checked that. We had about 18, 19 billion in cash. We had unutilized credit lines of about 40 billion. So let's call it close to 60 billion, right? So if we shut down everything, Okay, we just have to pay for our payroll, overhead, some of our fixed costs. What is the burn rate of that? And we calculated it at about 19 to 20 billion. So given this cash that we had, uh, given the unutilized credit lines that we had, we had about three years or two and a half to three years worth uh, of funding. Okay, to even if we generate nothing in the business, which obviously will not happen, just to assume the worst case. So we had about two and a half, three years. So we felt, you know, fairly, uh, fairly good that we had uh, this liquidity uh, in place. However, it's important that we don't use or we don't burn cash uh, during this period. So we set a second objective. Uh, for our operating units, which is what we call you square your operating cash flows. So you only spend what you collect. Okay, so during this period, we said, okay, maybe we just manage our project launches. We will have limited project launches this year. Maybe the land acquisition uh, could wait uh, a little bit. Uh, let's reduce our capital expenditures to only what we can afford. So we've reduced that from 110 billion to uh, to 70 billion uh, and then look at ways to generate additional cash in our case we've been fortunate uh, that we were able to introduce the first suite uh, in the company called avit uh, we were able to generate 12 billion pesos uh, we also sold some accounts receivable which is part of our regular program uh, that we were able to at least on track for this year to be able to square our operating cash flows in fact we even want wanted to go further we want to further strengthen our balance sheet. Okay, we wanted to improve our what we call our leverage uh, ratios. No, and uh, at the end of Q1, at the end of first quarter, our leverage ratio was uh, 0.86, or about 86% debt to 100% equity. No, and what we said is we wanted to bring that down uh, to the 0.7 to 0.8 level, and we're basically now uh, on track. Uh, to be able to do that because of the fundraising uh, that we've done. Uh, and then given the way interest rates have behaved uh, over the last uh, six months, and this is again credit to the central bank governor, uh, Ben Jokno, that he injected a lot of uh, injected liquidity uh, into the system. Uh, you know, reduced, I believe, the reserve requirements, reduced the benchmark rates. Uh, and, you know, we were able to now refinance uh, expensive short-term debt uh, to now a much lower uh, rate. So we feel good uh, about our financial sustainability. Again, these were the three initiatives uh, that we basically introduced uh, fairly quickly. And the team has done a, a marvelous job in terms of executing this. So given that we've, ass we've assured our financial sustainability, 
So we wanted now to focus on the other uh, objectives. Okay, uh, protecting our people. Very, very important. No? Um, I, I, you know, prior to, to you know, I was talking to, to Brother Bo, you know, a while ago uh, about uh, our people here at Ayala Land. That the success of Ayala Land uh, is not done by one individual or a few individuals. This is really a collective effort uh, of the team. Over the years, in fact, this is over decades, we built what I call institutional capability. Okay, to be able to deliver, uh, you know, these communities no? that basically uh, enrich the lives uh, of our customers. And this institutional capability is not easy to build. Okay, and, and you could you could see, I mean, you know, we have many, many, uh, you know, successful uh, you know, executives uh, who are part of our organization. Uh, who have since uh, retired or decided to to pursue alternative uh, careers, but nobody can really replicate no, what we've done here at Ayala Land. Okay, because it's really a collective effort. The capability doesn't reside with one person. Okay, it resides all across the organization. Okay, I, and then I'll be honest. Whether to be honest, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here now as a CEO. Once it's time for me to move on, I'm very confident <laughs> that, the, that the organization uh, will continue to will continue to thrive. So important that we maintain this institutional capability. So we wanted to protect our people, meaning we don't want to resort to across the board massive layoffs like. You know, what you see in very in, in many of the more developed markets no? uh, we're in you know at this first sign of trouble it's the people uh, that they basically let go we don't want that because that is uh, I guess a key asset uh, for us so we decided okay how do we protect our people so that even though they might not be as productive today because of the pandemic there's a downturn in business that wants the recovery that we have our team uh, intact. Once you know, we we feel that you know that's why it's very important for us to also make that statement, no, uh, to our people. Okay, and again during this pandemic, obviously people are very worried about their jobs, right? I, was, I get asked all the time, right? Every town hall that I have, you know, are we going to have across the board uh, layoffs? And then the answer is is no, we needed to reassure our people that we will not do that. At the same time, we also have to be truthful, right? Because, you know, obviously we could only sustain people if the business is sustainable. Okay, so my call to everybody was, we will do everything we can, okay, to be able to protect everybody's jobs. But this is really going to happen if we all get together to make sure that our business is sustainable. You know, otherwise, if our business is not sustainable, then it's hard to be able to protect uh, employment. Okay? So that's the first thing we did in terms of protecting uh, people. One is we made a decision, obviously, because it's important to maintain that capability and to reassure people that we will try our best and please try your best as well uh, to make sure that we're able to protect uh, everybody's jobs. Uh, next is, you know, we have many, many frontliners that continued to work uh, during this period. You know, obviously we cannot shut down. Uh, people rely on us. Uh, you know, our communities uh, had to continue to operate, particularly our customers are relying on us. Our offices were open, our hotels were open. Uh, so we need we had frontliners uh, working day in day out. So we needed to assure them that we will do everything we can uh, to protect them. So we did uh, you know testing, you know as well as provided them with uh, PPEs, no, uh, to to make them feel safe uh, when they go uh, to work. And we also said that you know those who don't need to go to the office during this period. Uh, please, you know, just stay at home and, and work from home. We're set up. We've been fortunate that we've invested uh, quite a bit of money on our digitalization initiatives that we could work 
uh, remotely. No? So, particularly during the ECQ period, we said, okay, those who can work from home, okay, uh, just just work from home. Okay, thirdly, and this is really a uh, Ayala Group initiative. You know, we were worried that uh, if our people contract uh, COVID, what do we do, right? Because you know we are like a, you know we're like a family, right? And uh, typically they'll come to us and they'll say, "Oh, how how you know uh, is there anything that uh, the group can provide uh, to the employees?" So what we did was at the group level, Ayala group level. First, we upgraded QualiMed. In uh, you know we we are part of a hospital chain, a QualiMed. Uh, we upgraded uh, QualiMed uh, New Valley to become a COVID ready facility. And we're doing that uh, as well as in the Qualimed in San Jose del Monte. So that if anybody gets sick, if the hospitals are full, at least we could call the medical director and we could say, oh, pwede ba, can you accommodate uh, one of our employees or, or family member, which has actually happened. Which has actually happened. You know, we get calls, frantic calls in the middle of the night that people needed to be rushed to the hospital and there was nowhere to go because the hospitals were full. Okay, so that was a, a significant, I guess, advantage being part of a hospital chain and a group having AC Health, no? That we are also uh, in the uh, in the health uh, in the health business. Uh, secondly, what happens now if uh, you do your contact tracing and people test positive? Uh, where do we now put these people? So we also invested at the group level in quarantine facilities. Okay, so we have now uh, one in New Valley as well as Ayala Land. We now have one also in Circuit. We're in if somebody is tested and they are uh, symptomatic or even asymptomatic and they needed to be quarantined, uh, we have a place uh, to, put, to, to put them. At Ayala Land, uh, given the cost of COVID care, uh, we also rolled out um, a program wherein we will top up uh, what the insurance uh, will pay for COVID care by another half a million. Okay, by another half a million pesos for all employees. So if you get sick, okay, obviously there, uh, there's still health, there's uh, our, our insurance. And on top of that, we self insured We said if anybody gets sick, we'll top up what the insurance and field health will not pay up to 500,000. And we felt that. We looked at the cost of an average, uh, you know, COVID uh, care if you get hospitalized, and this is well above uh, what will be needed. So it again provided reassurance uh, to our people: no? if you contract COVID, uh, that we will be there uh, for you. Uh, I just want to to end this particular section with just saying that uh, our help is actually extended, uh, you know, beyond uh, what I call our organic employees. Uh, we actually provided uh, 600 million to our no work, no pay uh, workers. These are primarily construction workers, uh, maintenance people uh, in our ecosystem. Uh, at, the start of the, at the start of the lockdown, these people were quickly unemployed. So we allocated 600 million right away uh, to be able to tidy them for a few weeks uh, during this pandemic. Uh, you know, obviously uh, we view them as part of our team. Uh, so we tried to stretch as much as we can. And we said, okay, let's allocate 600 million and provide them with this cash uh, to help them during this difficult uh, period. Our next trust is uh, to make sure we continue to serve our customers. As I've said, you know, our malls were open, you know, uh, for essential for essential services and businesses. Uh, our offices were open, uh, our hotels were open. But more importantly, as you know, we manage are different developments even after we finish construction. We have uh, Ayala Property Management Corporation, APMC, that does uh, property uh, management no? uh, for our developments. And they manage over 400 of these uh, associations uh, and estates. And of course, during the ECQ, the lockdown, the more people will need uh, services and reassurance uh, that you know, their, their condominiums, uh, the subdivisions, the estates will be maintained. Uh, that they will be secured. That security will continue to be in place. So we had 7,000 people during ECQ 
deployed in 400 communities throughout this period. Okay, our property managers, uh, customer service staff, uh, security personnel, maintenance stayed on site. Because obviously the people in the communities were also worried about people bringing in the virus. So they basically uh, stayed on site. And we just had to make sure that they were protected uh, as well. Uh, we also had, I guess, critical platforms in place. Now, and this was done not during the pandemic, but this was investment in technology uh, done uh, you know, years ago. That people who wanted to reach us uh, will be able to uh, reach us. Uh, in facilities that were open, like malls, offices, you know, obviously sanitation was top of mind. So we had to change, you know, our procedures uh, to make sure there's more frequent uh, sanitation. Again, to assure the people who are going into these, uh, you know, facilities. Uh, and then finally, we had to change the way uh, we do business. We had to accelerate things. So, for example, uh, for the malls, people were worried about uh, going to the malls. So we designed programs like curbside pickup. We just call the merchant and then you can pick up your uh, goods uh, along the curb. Uh, we now have a personal shopper called Anna. Uh, you can reach them through Facebook or through Viber. And you, know, you just tell them what you want and they will shop for you. Uh, we also have our own app uh, called uh, Zing. Uh, we're in our merchants are now, or many of our merchants are now listed there. And once you click it, it goes to their website and you can now order. Uh, things that uh, that you would want. Um, for a residential group, uh, you know, obviously there's not much uh, tripping, uh, site tripping uh, going on, but people were still interested uh, to look for uh, property during this period. So we really had to step up, you know, our um, websites uh, to be able to put in all the marketing materials, including brochures, uh, 360 degree uh, tour of the site. Uh, and made it capable were in all the information that you need to be able to make the decision of a property purchase is there. And then you, you could actually now do reservation online. So all the way through. Okay. Uh, in residential, we were also, we also had uh, units that were about to be turned over. Now, many of our clients uh, did not want to go on site. So we basically change our process and use technology to now to be able to do virtual turnovers. You don't have to go on site. Uh, there's a video, you'll be, you'll be able to see it. You wanna focus in a particular area, we could do that. You could do your punch listing uh, virtually. Okay, in fact, uh, we've turned over more than a thousand uh, units during this period and over half uh, were done uh, virtually. No? So these are just some of the ways uh, that we uh, continue uh, to serve our customers uh, during this period. Uh, moving on, uh, one of our initiatives is to help the community. And this is really something uh, that I'm really, really proud of in terms of the DNA uh, that we have here uh, in the Ayala Group. You know, for us, you know, it's just not about, you know, the business itself, right? But whatever we do, we need to make sure that we are also helping our country uh, move forward. That we're also part of helping the communities uh, develop. No? So, so it's not just about doing business for, the, for, for, for business's sake or to make money. Uh, that, that's, not, that's not the end all and be all. Uh, it's important that we're actually uh, helping out, uh, providing you know, services uh, that actually make a difference in people's lives. And in this case, given that the communities, our country uh, got hit by this pandemic, we felt that we needed to step up and do our share uh, in terms of helping uh, the communities as well as our uh, country. So let me just uh, highlight a few things. Uh, first, we decided quickly okay, that since most of the malls were only open for essential services, that we will waive the rental. And this was a, you know, half a minute, one minute discussion with our chairman, Fernando Zobel de Ayala. When I said, I think it makes sense, recommendation is to waive this, he quickly agreed. Without even 
you know, uh, you know, ask me, uh, you know, how much is that? No, because we felt that we needed to support our merchants who are primarily small, medium sized uh, enterprises. Okay, and as of the end of August, we've waived around uh, 5 billion pesos. Uh, for the year, we've also changed our rental structure. Uh, for the most part, it's completely variable. So if you're like a food merchant, uh, you're now only paying 5% of your gross sales. If you're a non-food merchant, it's 3%. If you are on a fixed rent, uh, we'll give you a discount anywhere from 50 to 70%. Okay, secondly, uh, we, have a, we have a program here at Ayala Land. We call it Ayala Land Pays It Forward. Uh, and this is purely employee contributions okay to help three public hospitals three public hospitals to buy equipment and ppe we were able to raise 82.6 million and and this one i'm really really proud because i don't know of any organization who was able to raise you know this much money from employees purely from employees to be able to help out uh, during this period. Uh, there's another program, and this was led at uh, by our chairman, uh, Fernando Zobel, called Project Ugnayan. No? And this is in collaboration with Caritas and the PDRF. We're in the program is to help the most marginalized people in our society. And the program is to give 1,000 peso uh, gift checks that they could now use in groceries no? uh, to be able to buy essentials. You could go to Pure Gold or SM or, or Robinsons to buy your essentials. The program raised 1.5 billion pesos. So we were able to help 1.5 million families. I'm proud that our team helped raise that 1.5 by talking to our uh, partners, our corporate partners, and we were able to contribute or raise 410 million uh, from the various partners uh, that we have. Um, Makati Development Corporation, uh, it's a construction arm that we have. Obviously, we have capability uh, to be able to do uh, quickly uh, work that was needed, whether that be quarantine facilities or testing centers. In this case, uh, MDC uh, donated uh, a testing facility in the Philippine Red Cross in Mandaluyong. Okay, so that's basically PCR uh, testing. They did it within, uh, I believe, uh, 10, 10 to 12 days. Uh, so Red Cross will have the capability to do the testing. In conjunction with the uh, IATF, uh, MDC was involved in converting uh, the World Trade Center into a 500-bed uh, quarantine uh, facility. Now. So, so these are the things that uh, our team has done uh, to be able to help out uh, during this most a difficult period. It's really nice to see, you know, uh, you know how, you know, people come together uh, to to help out uh, during during this period. And finally, uh, in our five point plan, is about thinking ahead. No, as I've said, recovery will happen, uh, no doubt. Uh, the recovery will happen. So we now have to start thinking about what do we do, right? How do we make sure that not only do we survive. But we thrive uh, during the reopening now that's happening, uh, as well as the uh, full resolution of the pandemic. So the first thing is, we ask ourselves, right? What are short-term changes and what are long-term changes? Right? So for example, office. Will people start working from home and therefore don't need offices? Or will people go back to offices uh, will people decide to live uh, in suburbs more so rather than city given that they they want more space uh, particularly uh, during uh, this pandemic uh, how are our various businesses affected uh, malls hotels residential and what changes are short term and what changes are long term so these are questions that we ask ourselves. Now, the important point here in this exercise 
is to have a point of view. Okay, you gotta have a position so you know how to map. You know how to map out how to move forward. Uh, so in this case, so for example, uh, you know, is there you know will more people move to the suburbs or city? We have a position for that. Uh, office, work from home, uh, stay in the office. We have a position for that. So we now know how we're gonna realign, uh, which is the second point, our investment priorities, both short term and long term. Uh, so for example, uh, will the hotel recover soon? Uh, will El Nido recover soon, or will it take a longer time? Uh, that has implications on our capital allocation uh, in terms of investments uh, moving forward. Uh, and finally. And this is not just because of the pandemic. Organizational transformation is continuous. Uh, the skill set uh, that you need uh, will evolve. So, for example, now, even it's not just because of the pandemic. Even pre-pandemic, uh, technology is playing a bigger and bigger role uh, in our lives. Okay, so therefore, skill set, uh, people who are tech savvy, uh, people who think digitally, particularly the millennials, we need skill sets like those. So more and more, we're basically beefing up uh, our capability in that area. Uh, leadership. What kind of leaders do we need uh, for the future? I remember when I first started my career, uh, we're in the leaders, you know, who were successful, were typically command and control. Uh, strong men. Okay. Today, I don't know if that's going to work. Uh, the way we try to organize here is we diffuse power. It is not centralized in one individual so that we could move much quicker. Okay, so these are the things that we, we think about in terms of positioning the company to thrive uh, after the pandemic. So let me just sum it up by just uh, talking about my three, uh, three key takeaways no? uh, on this pandemic. Uh, what I've noticed is, you know, this black, what they call black swans, no? black swan events. Uh, which I also call like tail risks, uh, low probability, high impact events are happening more, fre more frequently. I look at the last, uh, you know, I don't know, 20, 30 years, Asian financial crisis, 1997, 1998, was followed by the global financial crisis in 2009, 2010, and then now followed by uh, the global health pandemic. So it's almost like once every 10 years, you'll have some sort of a black swan event. Now, when this happens, you have to make sure your company is prepared, right? And, and what do I mean prepared? You want to make sure that you'll be able to survive. Because as I've uh, shown a while ago in the, in the chart uh, on the various crises, that there's a strong recovery. Okay, so make sure that as you take risks, Okay, and, and, and for many people, we want to maximize risk so we maximize return, right? You want to make sure that you watch out for that tail risk. That if an unforeseen, low probability, high impact event happens, then your organization is prepared to be able to handle that. Secondly, we want to, as an organization, turn these challenging situations into opportunities and into really proud moments. And I'm really, really proud how our team has responded, both in terms of serving our customers, in terms of helping out uh, the community. Uh, and, and this, and, and the, you know, the, the initiatives that we've had, I hope, uh, have truly made a difference uh, in the lives of our customers, as well as the, you know, communities that, that we, we've helped out. Uh, as I mentioned, for example, the public hospitals that we've given contributions were very, very appreciative. No? Uh, when we came up and stepped in relatively uh, quickly. Secondly, the world is in interconnected. Okay, our lives are interconnected. When you have a major situation like a pandemic of this sort, we need to get together. As people, as a community, as a country. And I was very, very pleased to see how different parts of our society got together, okay, to help out. The private sector, as an example, stepped up, okay, in terms of trying to help out uh, in this crisis. There's a lot of coordination uh, going on uh, between the private and the public sector in terms of reopening uh, the economy. Because at the end of the day, 
uh, we're all in this thing together. Uh, the only way we're going to be successful uh, as a business uh, is if the country is successful. Okay? Uh, and I think the only way our country will be successful also is if businesses are successful. Uh, and therefore, we generate employment for people, we uplift lives, uh, you know, increase the quality of life of the people. So I'm, I'm actually very happy to, to see that uh, during this pandemic, uh, we, saw the, we, we saw the strong Bayanian spirit uh, here in the Philippines, which, if, if I could say, I did not, you know, I have a hard time seeing in some other countries, like in Western countries, uh, parang, ano eh, kanya-kanya eh. Okay, parang kanya-kanya. Uh, here, I think as a people, uh, we, we came together. So really, really pleased uh, to, to see that. Very happy to see that. And finally, you know, in a crisis, it's about people. Okay, you have to make sure that your organization's got a strong culture of palasakit, that they care about the company. And this doesn't happen overnight. That means that we have to Treat people with respect, with dignity. And we have to treat them fairly all the time. So when a crisis happens, they are there for us. They are there for the organization. You cannot ask people who've been disrespected, mistreated in a crisis to step up. We just cannot expect that. So the culture of respecting people, treating people with dignity, is important so that in a time of crisis, they're there for you. And typically, when you do that, when you treat people with respect and dignity, they stay with the company. And therefore, you now end up with an experienced team, which is critical. You know, I, I compare it to like a basketball team, right? Because the people here at Ayala Land have been here uh, for a long time. Like my senior team, as an example, our average tenure is probably 20 years. So it's all, no, you know, in basketball parlance, creating no look pass all the time. We know where we are. Okay, we know where we are. We know our skill set. We know, you know, we could rely on each other. So you need to have that kind of team when a crisis uh, happens. No? So we're able to navigate uh, quickly. No? Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll end my presentation again. Uh, Brother Bo, Rex, thank you very much for this privilege. Uh, to be part of uh, your quarterly meeting. And uh, let me just end with a video uh, of Ayala Lando, a perfect video that I want to share uh, with everybody. So again, uh, good morning uh, to everyone.
Wow. Wow. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Bobby. Thank you. I thank think, you, I think, Bob. I think, I, think, I think I spoke too long, Greg. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. I I'm, used I'm, everything up. Uh. No, 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 no. I didn't even stop you. That was uh, again. Let me let me go through certain things. No, um, that video in itself no captures a lot of things. How Ayala Land impacts our lives, and this is something I'd like really to share with with a lot of our uh, Platinum members. You know the kind of metrics you look at. You know, in in that whole video, we never talked about net income. We don't talk about revenues. You talk about the company's impact on people and and how we continue to. To, to help the community. Again, very important, the metrics that would be there. Now, let me also focus and have a little bit of a wrap-up on your five-point plan, Bobby. Um, really very important that we put a lot of effort on strong financials. I guess there are a lot of very confident Ayala Land investors out there. You know, Ayala Land is uh, one of the, um, what do you call this, uh, uh, cornerstone of, of many of our portfolios. And uh, again, as I always say, I might not be an employee, but I'm a very, very happy uh, shareholder. Uh, and that's the reason why I thank you. Why I thank the entire team. Edward also has uh, very good words for Ayala Land whenever, whenever he gets to talk about the stock. Um, and we also are, are very, very confident customers. No, um, I guess with all that you're doing, even the customers, you know, the investments they've had, uh, they've made in the community, in the land and houses, in the condos, even in the offices, you know, are, are, are you know, feel protected. No, Again, um, yung, yung sinabi mo about protecting people, I, I guess all of that, no, taken together, this is also the reason why, you know, we, we all have to see why Ayala Land employees are not just loyal. You know, I call them fiercely loyal. They're, they're really very, very loyal people and that's the reason why they stay. That's the reason why we we have a very experienced team. Now, um, continuous service for customers. We're doing new things. We're doing different things um, to be in touch with them, to protect them, and then to hold their hand through this pandemic. And we're helping the community. We're also helping the country. Uh, I'm very amazed with the way you have, uh, you know, somehow raised almost 83 million uh, just from employees. You know? Somehow, uh, you know, when we think about tens of millions, if you're looking at corporates, madalian, you know, with with our companies and with the money that's there for for um, community and charity. But this money, 83 million from employees, and I heard uh, almost 100 percent contributed, no, 100 percent of Ayala Land employees. Powerful, really, really powerful. And I guess you know uh, the the real focus on transforming for the future, specifically leadership. Now, lastly. What I like to note, no, uh, Ayala Land as an international uh, known corporate, um, you're still largely Filipino. Yung, yung ginamit mo na bayanihan, yung ginamit mo na malasakit, that's really, really very powerful because these are values that we hold dear in our hearts. Now, uh, we will go to a you know question and answer, Bob. No, I hope you you will uh, you will bear with me. Um, I, I'm sure there there are going to be questions from our from our audience, uh, please do type it on the chat box. I'm going to be looking at that, but I, I, I prepared two questions for Bobby just to kick it off. But please do ask me questions there uh, that I can uh, ask Bobby. Um, there's also one, there's already one question there that I'll be asking after this, but please uh, guys, just, just type in your questions. Uh, and you know, if I have the chance to call you, you can probably even uh, ask Bobby directly later on. But I guess, Bobby, the first question that I have is, is this challenge, no? I mean, many of our people here are entrepreneurs. Now, Ayala Land is such a big, big conglomerate. But, you know, one of the biggest strengths is that Ayala Land works with so much entrepreneurship in its DNA. How do you do that as a big organization? Usually, a big organization somehow gets to lack that entrepreneurship because there is so you know, centralization and decision making and stuff like that. So how do you ensure that the organization and you know the worst part is like having all of those SBUs, no strategic business units, having all of those subsidiaries. How do they operate with uh, rich entrepreneurship, Bob? How do you do that? Well, well for, first, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you for the thank question. You for the question. First, it's about first, stock. stock. Okay, we made the uh, the decision, decision that, that we will. will Decentralized. decentralized. And when we say decentralized, decentralized. we are now, now 
four more organizations, organizations that will address, that address each, market each market segment. segment. So you were part of that part practice, of you know, in our grand architecture. architecture. So we said, so we said uh, Ayalan Premier, luxury ka, uh, Alveo, uh, upper mid, low high end, uh, Vida, middle income. Once you do that, you now put in a strong leadership team. Okay, very important that you have a strong leadership experience team there to attack that market segment. And then at the corporate level, like my job is, uh, let's set high goals for you guys to aspire. Diba? Galing kay Tony Aquino yan eh. Set high goals, right? Kasi there needs to be a direction. You set those high goals. So between structure, a leadership team, and then set high goals. And then now at the corporate, what I call, uh, you know, light touch. Okay? Light touch. So what are the things we look for at corporate? Okay? Uh, simple lang. I mean, you know, what's your planned investment? We just approved that. Or oh, execution. Bahala na kayo. What are the things we keep at corporate? Things where scale matters. So, for example, funding. If we go to the uh, bond market, oh, it's better if it's Ayala land because we're able to get uh, the best rates. Okay, we also consolidated procurement because scale matters. Okay, those that scale doesn't matter, we go for speed. Okay, speed means you now form these smaller teams. And just set those targets and the parameters for their target market, and then let them let them know, let them flourish. And so far, we've been successful in doing that. And again, I just want to highlight the leadership skill that's necessary. As I said, this leadership skill evolves because you cannot have somebody who's controlling. Okay, you have to be comfortable with uncertainty and trusting of people. So you have to be, as a person, highly empowering to be able to do that. And we saw that Rex with Mr. Aquino. I basically, uh, you know, learned from him and just continued on. And, and, and you know, the, you know, it, it's been uh, it's been great. I think for the company and also for the people uh, that they are empowered and they're able to move things forward. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Uh, I guess uh, that that gentleman that i know will never ever take uh, credit no but uh, i will i will have to tell the the guys this uh, i know ayala land uh, and its organization when i came in and i see it now it's it's very different no uh, there there are no pockets of power in head office you know there was a time when head office controls everything no the budget design <laughs> Alam mo yun, Rex, I mean, you, you witnessed how difficult that period was and i i, I would also say no? Before, Before, the fights, fights were about corporate, corporate allocation, allocation, your cost of corporate, how you allocate, how you allocate to the SBS. Now, it's not talked about because it's now so small. We reduced corporate and really shifted uh, the responsibility and autonomy to the line units. No? And, and I call it my, ano, it's kind of like my line-based management organization that most people have to be part of a line organization that's servicing a particular customer segment. If you're not part of that, you better have a good reason. Okay, that's why corporate now, uh, I think our corporate for our size, uh, pure corporate, we're probably down to about 80 people. And that's primarily finance uh, people, IT, uh, IT people. And you know my model, I used to work for a multinational company. We were in uh, operating in like 70 countries and we only had about 26 corporate people. That for me is the model, you know, and then if you need help, just get people from the line for shared, uh, you know, shared resource. But that was really the model that, uh, you know, I tried to, uh, I tried to emulate. No? We're in really shrink the corporate, but it's important that you have good people. Okay, I was once asked, when I first started, I had about 19 direct reports. Okay, 19 direct reports. When I started in this leadership position. And I was asked, how do you manage that? Okay, and I have a very simple answer. Kung lahat yung magagaling, kahit isang daan, okay lang. Okay, pero kung may isang, kung isang medyo isang may problema that we're not aligned, eh problema yan. Kasi it will eat up a lot of time. 
So you could have you know 50, 100 direct reports, but if all of these guys are good, you don't have to talk to them often, di ba? As long as you're aligned, and as long as you know they're doing the right thing, uh, that we uh, it's based on our values and who we are, then no problem. Thank you, thank you, Bob. Uh, I remember the time when architects are centralized, construction is centralized. Now you have them. Even land acquisition is now held by 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 the subs. No, that that's a uh, that's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, my next question, Bob. Uh, you mentioned the name Tony Aquino. I guess all of us admire that gentleman. But do you have other mentors, advisors, heroes that you look up to? Uh, leaders that also helped you in your journey, um, how they impacted you, your leadership yeah. style, your yeah. life. Uh, can you share that with us? My, my philosophy, uh, Rex, is I try to learn uh, from, uh, from everybody. You know, obviously, I've learned a lot, a lot uh, from good bosses. Uh, but to be honest, I also learned a lot from the not so good bosses. Okay, because it taught me on what not to do. Okay, it taught me. It taught me a lot about, you know, this is not the right way of doing. So I was exposed to that. So I learned from from both, no? But uh, let, let me highlight a few, uh, I guess, uh, good bosses. No? Uh, let me just highlight, you know. Uh, you know, I, I really admire, uh, you know, our principals here, no? Uh, both uh, uh, Jaime Augusto as well as uh, Fernando, no? Uh, Fernando's my, my direct boss, no? And I really admire them because of the way they look at the business, that we're in business to do good. Okay? We are not just in business for profit. Diba? We, our businesses will have to be, uh, you know, vehicles wherein we help our country uh, move forward. Okay? And the only way uh, as a business we're going to move forward is if our country moves forward. So we should not do anything that will harm our country because that is short term. If you're in for a long game, you have to make sure that everything you do helps us develop as a nation. And we're primarily a Filipino company. You know, our, you know, our fortune is tied to, to what happens here in the Philippines. So we should not do anything that will harm our institutions or what have you. Uh, that we should do everything that we can uh, to be able to help our country move forward. Uh, see, Jaime uh, was just in a conference, no? uh, and this was basically, I believe, uh, 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 done by uh, my, my alma mater, University of Chicago, good school. No? So he was a guest. You know, where I, where I went to school, it's about free market. Okay, sabi ni, you know, Milton Friedman was big at the time, said that the social responsibility of uh, companies is to make profits. If you let the market function freely, then, you know, uh, the uh, invisible hand of Adam Smith uh, will happen that, you know, all good things. But, you know, what Jaime said, which I, which I agree, is we're interconnected, that we have a broader responsibility. Uh, we have a broader stakeholder. Uh, group uh, that we need to not only look at our own business but our impact uh, around us no? and how it helps us uh, move forward. So, you know, obviously I, I admire uh, both of them. No? Uh, it's, it's a, you know, uh, they, they really set the tone uh, for the organization. And I've mentioned already Mr. Tony Aquino, uh, who's also very, very instrumental uh, in my development. And uh, See, Tony, I really admire him, uh, you know, both as a business person, but also as an individual. Okay, uh, he really has uh, people's development at heart. Okay, and I can tell you how important it is uh, that people believe in you. Uh, and Tony was one of those guys uh, who believed in me. Okay, because uh, you have doubts. I mean, can you imagine when... I was asked to assume the leadership position at Ayala Land. I'm taking over from Tony Aquino, right? Management man of the year. Okay, <laughs> management man of the year. So I'm because, am I setting myself up for failure? Okay. Uh, you know, so, you know, I'm very, very grateful that he believed in me. And up to today, he continues to uh, to mentor me. No? 
Uh, I also learned from my peers. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I learned a lot from you. I really learned a lot from you. I'm not a marketer. You know, uh, I've learned a lot uh, from you, uh, you know, about firing on all cylinders, about how to, you know, live your life, you know, how to have a complete life. You know? I've also learned from uh, reading. You know, I, uh, you know, obviously on a business standpoint, I admire uh, people like Warren Buffett. You know, I've read, you know, all his annual reports since the 1960s and I've learned a lot. You know what I did? I downloaded it to the internet, you know, and then I read everything. Okay, a good, uh, I think, 40 years worth of annual uh, reports. Uh, you know, Jack Welch of GE also is, uh, you know, I've read several of his books. Uh, you know, I, I admire for his straightforward, being really straightforward. Uh, being candid, being truthful, and, and really moving on things, uh, you know, quickly. Uh, people like uh, Benjamin Franklin also on how to live your life. Uh, you know, entrepreneur, educator, philanthropist. You know, so so many many people have uh, you know have influenced me, and, and I've been really been grateful. And again, it's both uh, people who were good and not so good. Thank you, thank you for that, Bob. I, I guess it's really a a real privilege, you know, to work for. The Zobel brothers for Tony Aquino, you know, much like you, they've, they've impacted my life and probably anything that we do forward will always have this bit of influence uh, uh, from them. No, uh, In fact, even my kids now, I always say what I shared with you guys earlier, you know, what will Fernando do? What will Jaza do? What will they do if they're in this particular situation? I guess Ayala executives have that challenge eh, to think that way so that they, they become more humble and they become more effective. Now, uh, again, uh, Clement Bob has a very sensitive question, but I guess the hard questions have to be yeah, asked yeah, here. Yeah. Um, uh, respectfully, and then I like the, 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 way, the way it is framed, respectfully, how is Ayala Land dealing and coping with delays in property turnovers? I guess uh, it's not just Ayala Land, it's the entire industry, but yeah. technically, I mean, for Ayala Land itself, obviously, uh, you know, we were delayed in our turnovers. How do, how do we now, you know, deal with this? But first of all, no, you know, obviously, my, my apologies for those who have been affected by, by the delay. Obviously, this is a very, very uh, difficult time uh, for the industry. Uh, we're, in, we're not really able to deploy uh, the number of workers that are necessary to be able to complete uh, the projects uh, on time. No? But we're, we're trying our best and we're making uh, you know, progress. Uh, today, we usually deploy around 60,000 people in all our construction sites. And now we're down to 25,000 uh, people. No? So, so there will be, uh, unfortunately, in a few projects, uh, there could be some, some delays. No? So in terms of how we handle it, okay, first of all, we will not rush it just for the sake of turning over. Okay, we want to make sure that when we turn over a project, that it does uh, justice to the promise uh, that we've given, uh, you know, uh, as well as, you know, uh, in accordance to our brand standards. So we will not, you know, just rush it at all. Okay, we will not do that. We want to make sure that it's in accordance to what we had committed uh, and it's a, a safe place, no? particularly uh, to live. Uh, for those uh, that have been affected by delay, uh, we usually uh, handle it uh, individually. No? And ako, simple naman yung principle ko eh. I tell, I tell our people, uh, treat each customer fairly. Okay, fairness. Sa akin, ganun lang. Uh, so, if there's anybody who's been affected, then uh, I would advise to talk to our uh, customer relations people. And the principle I've always given them is, basta fair tayo. Okay, that, that we are fair. Uh, to the clients. Wonderful, wonderful, Bob. Uh, this question is uh, a nice one, a very nice question from Arlene. Uh, leading Ayala looks to be so overwhelming, no? Uh, such a big conglomerate. Uh, how do you take care of yourself? How do you uh, keep that fitness? Uh, I guess not just m physically, but also mentally and stuff like that. Well, ano, it's about having a balance. I think it's about having balance and, and knowing your uh, priorities, no, uh, as well. Obviously, work is a big part of my life, uh, but so is my uh, my family. I've been very, very uh, blessed uh, with a very supportive, uh, loving wife, si Lani, no, uh, who supports me in in, in what I do. Uh, my kids have not given me, you know, any problems. Okay, uh, in in fact, as I think I mentioned a while ago, uh, their accomplishments have put me to shame and have actually set the benchmark, uh, you know, for me. Okay, uh, when you have a kid who's got more Google entries than you, 
eh, that's only 17 years old eh, may problema may problema po di ba so <laughs> so so yo so I try to keep a balance and I also try to uh, you know keep in shape particularly during this pandemic no we're in ano eh, it's really a uh, high level of anxiety okay so I've stepped up uh, my I guess uh, routine on 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 on, on exercise no uh, and then sa akin, routine is very important eh. like you can see me Rex I'm dressing my barong it's like I've never changed during this pandemic. Kahit when I was working at home, I would dress up, I would wake up at the same time, I'll eat at the same time, you know, I'll work at home at the same time, I'm wearing the same clothes, I don't wear shorts, okay? So it puts me in that right, uh, in that right, uh, you know, uh, frame of mind. So again, uh, I think it's, at the end of the day, it's balance. Uh, two is maintain a certain discipline. Uh, maintain a certain discipline in your life in terms of, uh, you know, time allocation in terms of, uh, you know, uh, watching out for your health. And also, as, uh, as I mentioned, routine is a very big part of it. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I guess I've, I've known Bob for a long, long time. Uh, you know, we box together. Yeah. We <laughs> play yeah, golf I together. <laughs> I, I, I miss those. Huh? Um, kasi na may mix ni Bobby yung trabaho with the exercise. Eh. Um, he's always a guy who probably would hit three birds in one no. stone. Um <laughs> And I think I can just say, Rex, no, I see it's overwhelming eh, when you think about it. But it's about people. It's about people. If you have the right people uh, in place uh, and have the perspective that, you know, obviously things won't be perfect, but always move forward. And if decisions are made in accordance to the company values, uh, no problem. We will just move forward. Thanks, Bob. How, this one's really nice also from Marco. Huh? How do you encourage creative thinking? Because obviously in a big conglomerate like Ayala Land, sometimes the metrics are all set. Uh, sometimes our, 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 our processes are, are well laid out and this has been born out of great experience. But there still needs to be some creativity, some freshness in our ideas. How do you, how do you uh, encourage that? Tough targets. Tough targets. That will push people uh, to be creative if you set uh, if you set tough targets. Uh, I I also you know unfortunately just this, this pandemic is a bit uh, difficult. But you know this actually we try to get together uh, with you know with people no uh, and try to talk to them because you know it's important that uh, you know through conversation eh, I mean ideas and and sometimes it is in those relaxed moments that you come up with these ideas. Uh, unfortunately, during this pandemic, we're not able to to do it, no. Uh, but for me, you know, all these uh, after work, uh, you know, discussions with the you know with the leadership team is very important because when you're relaxed, sometimes all these ideas come up eh? and no pressure, right? You could say anything you want, uh, and there's no pressure, right or wrong, and then you're able to to flesh out some of these things. No? But but primarily, Rex, what we've seen here in this organization through tough targets. Uh, you know, people really get creative uh, and then try to make it happen. Just like to share with you guys, uh, Bob's also well known for for uh, taking time with the team, for for uh, unwinding uh, in the evenings at times. Uh, let me share this with you. He doesn't drink. So, habang umiinom lahat, siya diluted iced tea. I have to highlight that iced tea na diluted pa. Oh, nag-wine na ako ng konti, Rex. <laughs> Kasi yung mga ibang social events, no choice eh. So, natuto na ako. <laughs> so, even if he's uh, de dealing and talking with some tipsy people, uh, he's not tipsy but he can act like one. Uh, very creative, Bob. Uh, this is a question of, of Brother Bo himself, no? Uh, and uh, let me let me let me read through this because uh, there's a bit of detail here. I'm amazed at Ali's decision to serve the broader market, creating real estate for the lower economic strata of society. Question: Was this a profitable move? Is there fortune at the bottom of the pyramid? Quoting the book of uh, C.K. Prahalad, or does the Pareto principle still apply? Does most of Ali's profits come from the top 20% of its wealthy customers? What percentage of Ali's profit come from the lower market? I, I don't have a uh, brother boy, I don't have the exact uh, breakdown. Uh, but if you can imagine before, uh, it was 100% primarily high end. Uh, I would venture to guess now over 50% uh, 
uh, is coming in from the broader uh, from the broader market no and it is actually uh, you know quite uh, you know it it gives you a decent return on capital okay i wouldn't say that you'll make a killing but it basically uh, it basically uh, is in accordance to you know our typical uh, hurdles no financial uh, hurdles no but it's a much bigger market that's the flip side you know when when you look at it it's a much bigger market so so it is uh, it is uh, and, and actually it's been a, a quite a rewarding uh, journey uh, for the company no? And and, and, and and the important, important again, thing, uh, brother Bo, no, the important thing also is that's why we did this, is because we really want to be part of the broader or part of the national agenda uh, for development. Because otherwise, what are we, diba? If we're not going to be part of the solution in terms of moving the country forward, and for us to be able to uh, to do that, we needed to expand. Uh, our product offerings uh, to be able to reach out to more Filipinos. I guess it's just a uh, a decision, brother Bo, that that Ali won't get to list its subsidiaries. Eh? But if you're going to be looking at Alveo or an Abida as a separate property developer, they can stand toe to toe with some of the other listed firms out there. It's just that you can take a piece of these great developments, these great companies, only through Ayala Land. They're not spinning them off. Uh, they're holding them within brands uh, in their residential architecture. Now, let me move on to a uh, question of Ruth. Uh, thanks so much for your inspiring talk, Sir Bobby. May we ask your opinion about office spaces and dormitories? Will I veer away from expanding in these areas in the coming years? Yeah, actually, office, again, this is, remember I, I talked about uh, short-term versus long-term changes. A uh, while ago, right? And office was one of them. We said that uh, will people work from home or will they go back to the office? Now, I believe uh, that people will go back to the office. Okay? I mean, there's no substitute for human interaction. Okay? We, they talked about this already for a long for, for a long time, no? They said that uh, when the internet uh, first started, they said, oh, this will now, uh, this is now the death of distance. We're in distance doesn't matter. Okay? Because you can now work anywhere. Uh, what has happened during that period over the last what uh, 20 25 years even more concentration okay why so cities became even bigger why because there's so much advantage to that density eh? okay one for companies talent okay talent you're able to attract a variety of talent and then the businesses are also become to be highly synergistic it feeds off one another uh Okay, secondly, quality of life, variety. People told me, and this one I'll tell you, even some of our uh, uh, you know, people are saying, oh, maybe now we could work from home, we'll work on the beach. Okay, sa beach na tayo, we'll just live on the beach. Ay, okay lang yun sa simula. Okay. <laughs> you, you'll, get, you'll get tired of it. Okay, you look for interaction, you look for variety. Like when you live in a city, it's complete. May hospital, may escuela, and then arts and leisure. It's complete. Eh? People look for variety. That's why cities don't bet against cities. History has shown cities will continue to thrive. So for me, I'm not betting against cities. Even they say, okay, no work from home. Ngayon. Once this pandemic is over, people will start coming back. You'll get the density concentration. Uh, so even our own uh, strategy is, is hinge on that. I mean, we'll continue to develop this uh, large-scale integrated uh, mixed-use communities, which are like mini cities. That's great, Bobby. I also want to share with people that uh, the common notion that to be environmentally sensitive and sustainable, you will have to go out and move out of the cities. That's actually wrong. The concentration in cities actually will be the more efficient, more sustainable way because you don't need transport. Okay. Okay. You don't need stuff like that. Meaning, meaning that the more uh, sprawling you get, the worse it is for the environment, yeah. right? Let, so let, I, I get that's the thrust. Yeah, let me just add something to, to my answer to Ruth's question. No? Uh, you know, obviously in the short term, uh, there may be uh, a little bit of uh, a higher level of vacancy in office. And this is primarily not because of corporates or BPOs. This is primarily POGOs uh, who are leaving. No? Uh, as, as you've seen, uh, POGOs are, 
uh, you know, are leaving the country. So there will be some uh, space that will be uh, vacated. So I guess as the economy grows, that will be mopped up. Uh, but it could take a uh, you know a year, a couple of years or so before that like, before that extra space is mapped up. But long term, if you ask me, is there a future for office? The answer is yes. Bob, I think we move on to the last two questions. Now, this question is regarding uh, a read from Tata Chavez. Uh, there was a time when you know uh, a read got got IPO'd, and uh, there was a bit of confusion on the first week. You know, Edward was uh, really very instrumental in um, you know explaining what ARIT is, uh, the kind of investment people can expect out of it. You know, I did come up with the video yeah, as well. But, you, yeah. right, <laughs> but right now, uh, this one comes from Tata. No? Thank you for the presentation. It is comforting to know that I have invested in the right company. But pertaining to ARIT, what is the current market outlook to this investment, especially now that people are still working from home? Oh, no, it, it continues to be good. I mean, the the tenant base of uh, the AWIT buildings uh, that we've, uh, uh, I guess, uh, transferred to the company, you know, the Ayala land buildings that we, we basically injected to AWIT, uh, those are very sta uh, stable tenancy. Uh, those are BPOs. Uh, those, wala, wala, ano dyan, wala pogo dyan. Uh, and, and our commitment is to continue to grow that. And, and the leases don't expire like in one month or two months. These are fairly medium term uh, leases. And as you know, when, an, uh, when a company invests in fit out, Typically, they don't, they don't stay only for five years. A minimum mo dyan, 10 years na siguro. Diba? So, our commitment is to continue to grow that vehicle. In fact, uh, yesterday, I think it was announced that we're introducing or we're injecting another asset, no? uh, which is the 30th uh, office uh, development along Ortigas, uh, in the Ortigas area. And the yield of that will be accretive. So I think we introduced it at a cap rate of uh, 5.8 uh, by the time IPO. Uh, with this uh, introduction of these new assets, the yield should go up. So, so I, I feel very positive. In fact, uh, we've lined up uh, another asset or two uh, next year uh, to inject into the uh, the REIT vehicle. So if people are looking for a stable uh, income or stable dividend uh, yield, I think AWIT is a very good uh, vehicle, particularly now we're in you know, the interest rate environment is really low. You look at the bonds, uh, what they're trading at. I just saw a list uh, the other day. Uh, you know, it's really uh, it's really so low uh, these days. So if you're looking for fixed income uh, with growth potential, then uh, a REIT uh, could be something that you 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 might want to consider. Guys, always remember what we have said. Uh, the, that accretive power is very important because the company can borrow at very low rates, and then you get assets that can actually earn a lot more than. Uh, than the interest you're paying. So basically, your uh, interest rate, your dividend yield will be higher. Now, I'd want to look at... Not to mention, so Rex, I'll just add another thing. Uh, not to mention that these leases have escalations. Okay, may escalation rate pa yan. Uh, so may natural, may okay. natural increases over time. Hindi pa yung accretive, so dagdag pa yun. Um, I also want to read these comments from Dean Pax. Uh, doing good is the man, while doing well is the manager. Good comes from the heart while uh, well goes into the pocket. You need to do good and to do well at the same time. You know, um, uh, Brother Dean is also congratulating you, Bob, congratulating thank you, you, thank you brother and Dean. Ali for, for uh, job well done. Now, let me end this with this last question. Kasi ito narinig nila sa akin to. But I always quote you on this, Bob, because I learned this from you. You remember our three Bs. You yeah. know, when we get to teach all our leaders... You know, when, when I go into that orientation program and we teach future leaders in Ali, we talk about your three Bs, di ba? Uh, and that's brand, business model, and bench. Now, all that you've discussed, obviously, in dealing with the pandemic, what, what other things, what refinements have you introduced to these three Bs now that we're in COVID and we'd like to be able to survive and thrive after COVID? Well, you know, let's say the three Bs. No? I think that's a very good framework. Uh, now, obviously, the elements in each of those pillars evolve because things change. Uh, so, for example, I'll give you an example. Let's say, let's talk about brand, right? So, for us now, uh, for, for to have a uh, strong, successful brand, uh, maybe compared to 15 years ago, technology might not be as important in terms of providing service. Okay, but now technology contactless is very important. So, for example, yung uh, property management company natin, uh, APMC, has now has has now an app that 
that they're rolling out to the various communities, contactless na. You know, you want to communicate with them, circulars, uh, your billing, etc. It's now all contactless. So that, again, the element to build that brand will evolve depending on uh, advancement in technology or what have you, or people's preferences. A safety is another one. Obviously, safety now is top of mind. So we need to step up uh, on some sanitation practices so people feel assured uh, that they are safe in our development. In terms of business model, obviously, I mentioned a while ago, we will now have to look at our investment program uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, where do we now allocate our capex, both in the short, medium term, and long term? Diba? It will depend on the recovery of each of those uh, business lines. Uh, and then on, on the bench, again, this is something that I mentioned a while ago, the leadership skill. Diba? You can see how that has changed you know, over the last 30 years. What is now valued compared to what was valued uh, 30 years ago. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. This has been quite a treat for our uh, TRC Platinum members. I guess I have to say this to everyone, guys. You don't see Mr. Bobby D doing this all the time. <laughs> This is such a rare occasion. And let me tell you, uh, uh, this is quite an honor and a privilege, Bob. Uh, alam ko, you don't, you don't do these things, no, but... But no, basta si Rex, and, and, basta si Rex. And, and remember, Rex, when you asked me, in less than a minute, I responded. In less than a minute. Basta si Rex. But, but uh, thank, thank, you, you, thank, thank you, thank you, Rex. Thank you, thank you brother Bo, for this uh, privilege. Uh, uh, to be part of your quarterly briefing, and then thank you everyone for uh, for you know I guess listening to what that what has turned out to be a fairly longish uh, talk now, but I hope you found it informative, powerful, Absolutely. not just informative, Bob, powerful. Thank you, thank you so thank much, you. Bobby, brother Bo. Thank you. Back to you now.